So the uh, end of our day approaches, but uh, what better way to uh, culminate a day of highly interesting uh, meetings than to have uh, join us uh, Senator John McCain of Arizona, who was uh, elected to the House of Representatives in 1982 and to the Senate in 1986, and so he's been in the United States Senate for 31 years, and he's, uh, uh, among other responsibilities, chairman of the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee, and of course he was a uh, presidential uh, candidate. You didn't have to mention. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to hear your <laughs> sleeping like a baby story. <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us. I should add uh, that uh, my own acquaintance with uh, and friendship with the senator goes back many, many years to the, the early 1980s when I was ambassador to Honduras. And then again, when I was stationed in Mexico and Senator McCain coming from the neighboring state of Arizona uh, was a frequent visitor to our uh, post and a very strong supporter of the North American uh, free trade agreements. So, John, we've been talking about uh, the hemisphere today. There's a lot of discussion of trade. Wilbur Ross was here, and among other people, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Paco Palmieri, the acting assistant secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs. And there were a number of issues that uh, came up, and I thought maybe if I could just mention a couple of them and ask your views on those. And, and I thought perhaps I might start uh, with Venezuela, given the situation there, and given the fact also that uh, on the 8th of May you uh, wrote an op-ed piece, which was an excellent piece on why we must support uh, human rights, and the situation in that country now seems to be approaching some sort of a boiling point, although it's been doing that for a long, long time, and just be interested in hearing your take on the situation there. And what it is you think the United States can do about it? Not a lot. I think that, first of all, thanks, John. Thanks for your long service. John and I go back to the Coolidge administration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we like Cal. He was a great guy. Uh, the, uh, I, th I thank you. Uh, look, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of things happening in the world and in our hemisphere. And this wave of populism is one of them. But I think the Venezuela one is especially disturbing for a whole lot of reasons. Recently, people have been killed. There's no doubt that the media shows pictures of babies literally starving, uh, people going through garbage dumps that who were some time ago middle income, quote, middle class individuals. And uh, apparently, Mr. Maduro is going to imprison more people. I met with the wife of one of the, the leading opposition who was in Washington a few weeks ago. Uh, she's a, just a fantastic uh, person. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a wife or husband and, and having one, your spouse in, in prison, not allowed to see that spouse. And of course, he it was uh, really the not only symbolic but actual leader uh, of the opposition. It's hard to believe that he's, that Maduro has stayed in power as long as he has. Um, I hope that we can try to exercise some pressures on him. One of the problems with sanctions, as we all know, and I, some of the things I say here insult your intelligence, but when you impose sanctions, you really do hurt people. And sometimes you hurt a lot of innocent people on the way to, to harming the government. And when you have a, a person such as Maduro, he, he probably doesn't give a damn. Although uh, the massive demonstrations have been really remarkable. All I can say, John, is that this is, this is an affront to everything we stand for and believe in in our own hemisphere about human rights, about dignity, about people's right to uh, express their views. We're now using force to break up these demonstrations, although they're not, they're so massive they're not able to. I, I would like to see 
maybe this is a little utopian, but I'd like to see the OAS maybe think about something even along the lines of condemnation, of, of, of really exercising the prestige that is associated with the Organization of American States. Frankly, they have a reputation of being a great debating society. It would be nice to see them to take a very firm and strong stand and in, in behalf of these innocent millions who are suffering, what is it, 2,000 percent inflation? Some ri ridiculous uh, thing is that. I know we're not going to spend more time on it, but if we really believe in human rights, we should have the President of the United States of America speaking out on their behalf. Right, and just to say that the Secretary General of the OAS uh, has been a leader on this been subject. very good at it, yeah. and I was interested that Venezuela announced their uh, re departure. It's the first time in the history of the OAS that, as we all know, that a country has withdrawn from membership. Well, thank you for those views. Uh, something a little closer uh, to home, uh, Mexico, NAFTA, uh, U.S.-Mexican relations. It kind of uh, Mr. Trump's position early on in the campaign and even now has created quite a bit of uncertainty in, in the country of Mexico, not to mention Canada, but I think Mexico mostly. You've seen reactions to that. The value of the peso goes down. It's gone up and down a little bit like a yo-yo. But uh, I'd be very interested in, in your views. I think we'd all be in, in, in the, the prospect, the future of NAFTA, really, and the future of the U.S.-Mexican relationship. As some of us remember when George, George Herbert Walker Bush signed the NAFTA in, uh, in the front lawn of the White House when the Prime Minister of Canada gave uh, one of the more moving speeches that, that I've heard about our relationship. Bob Dole and I and a couple other senators flew down to Mexico City to meet with then President Salinas. I mean, we celebrated NAFTA. And my friends, if you look at the economy in my state, there was reason to celebrate. I mean, our Arizona Chamber of Commerce has, has done a survey. It would be about 200,000 jobs directly affected by NAFTA if we stopped it. My friends, there, there's lines of trust. Our, our challenge in Arizona, as it is in other ports of entry, is expanding the capability to handle all the traffic. And when you say that when parts go to Mexico and are, the automobile is put together in Mexico and it comes back, that that's a total loss for America, that's, that's, a, that's not true. It's not true. And uh, it has done wonders for the economy of Mexico. What could have been the best thing for American immigration? A, me a Mexican middle class, a strong Mexican economy. It's not an accident the last few years there's more Mexicans that have gone back to Mexico than have come across the United States of America. Why? Because there are jobs and opportunity where they live, which is exactly the reason why they're coming from the three Central American countries where there is no opportunity and gangs and, and all of those uh, things. Uh, aspects of the terrible s situation that we see, including these gang members being exported to the United States of America and committing murder. So all I can say is that every agreement needs to be reviewed. No one should be against reviewing NAFTA. It's been 20 some years now, that's fine. But to negate it would have the worst possible effects in my view on my own state. I'm a senator from Arizona. I'm a United States senator, but I'm a senator from Arizona. I need to represent the people of Arizona. And I'm gonna do everything in my power not to see this blow to my state's economy, which will put so many people out of work. Then, of course, there's the larger implications of our relationship with Mexico. Let's face it, my dear friends, for a long time it wasn't good. And it wasn't good because of Mexican perception of the way the United States had treated Mexico, for which there was some validity. And now, our relationship with Mexico, until this came up, was absolutely Tremendous. The governor of Sonora and the governor of Arizona have a very close relationship. We spend time together. We do things together. My, my friends, Spanish was spoken in Arizona before uh, English was. 
Hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry I get so passionate about it. I apologize and I shouldn't have talked uh, so long. But I happen to be, believe in free trade. I also happen to believe the American, the American worker can compete with any worker in the world. And I don't think the, le the playing field is that unlevel. Which brings me, by the way, to the lumber thing with Canada. Couldn't we have sat down and tried to negotiate that issue rather than send the message early in an administration that we're going to retaliate? I, I, I'm not sure that's how we should treat our relationship with Canada either. I think, yeah, I think the answer to that latter question is that there had been two, three prior yeah. agreements and then they lapsed. And uh, I think you're right. The administration could have opted to pursue an agreement first. Before. I would hope so. I would hope so. Yeah. Well, and this the, By the I, way, uh, so I speak about the United States and Mexico. I would remind you that I, we have we welcome thousands and thousands of our Canadian friends who come and spend the winter with us in Arizona. We're very <laughs> grateful. <laughs> We're extremely grateful. The only thing that angers me is when we have a hockey game and we play Edmonton or Calgary. There are more goddamn shirts for those teams. Than <laughs> And there is for the Arizona Coyotes. But other than that, I know very much. And quite a few actually decide to take up residence there, too. I've noticed that. Uh, we talked about immigration. We talked about Mexico. Could I talk about immigration a bit with yeah. you, my friends? Sure. Because I think it's a, a, a really important issue. Uh, sooner or later, we will address the issue, okay? You can't have 11 million people washing around your country that are there illegally. Uh, that and and not address it at some time. And I won't review the, the past except to say I worked with Ted Kennedy the first time to, for comprehensive immigration reform. We worked, the eight of us, one of them was Chuck Schumer, the now majority leader, called the Gang of Eight. I hate that when a gang. Uh, and uh, we got it through the Senate with a very large number and they refused to take it up in the House of Representatives. The issue is not going away. We need to have a secure border. We need to have a path to citizenship for people who have been in this country. Long, hard, tough path. Back taxes, behind everybody else, learn English. All of those things that you would expect someone qualified for citizenship should do. We have to have E-Verifies that an employer will hire someone that doesn't have the E-Verify proving they're in the country legally. That employer is uh, prosecuted. Uh, and we also have to uh, take care of the dreamers the children, people who are brought to our country as children. They weren't brought at their own volition, and they should have an opportunity to become citizens. That is the broad outlines of an immigration reform that will sooner or later in this country uh, be adopted. And uh, we have a program, by the way, if I could just mention, if you're a green card holder and you enlist in the, in the military, agree to serve in our military, you have an accelerated path to citizenship. There are green card holders, my friends, and I've met them, who have literally lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan in the hopes of become citizens of the United States of America. We shouldn't forget how precious that is and what people are willing to do in order to achieve it. The, uh, there's also the aspect of Central Americans and the programs we have now to help fund the so-called Northern Triangle with different kinds of programs to help encourage more economic development there in Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras. And I was happy to see that in this budget that's going to carry out until October 1st, the money uh, allocated by the administration's budget, I think, is roughly equivalent to what was voted last year. And so hopefully that attention can continue to the issue of the development and the well-being of these Central American countries, because that's the next problem after having dealt with the problem of immigration from Mexico. Could I mention one other aspect Please. of our relations with Mexico? There is a flood of Mexican manufactured heroin coming into our country. And I um, regret to say that one of the major distribution points is Phoenix, Arizona, because it comes across the Sonoran border. We're going to have to do a better job of enforcing our security. It's killing people all over the Midwest and the Northeast. And it's vicious, and fentanyl is part of it, and that's killing people as well. As they're taking off opioids for whatever reason and turning 
to this Mexican heroin, uh, it, is, it is a very serious issue and argues again for a secure border as far as the flow of drugs is concerned. As far as the Northern Triangle is concerned, John, uh, it's going to be a very, very, very big problem for a very long time. I, I read that 10% uh, of the population of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador have left their home countries in the last two years. The last two years, 10% of the population. And that is a, that is, and I think we've done a lot to try to help. We've met, I, I myself have met with the presence uh, of those three countries. We have invested $750 million is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we are gonna keep that commitment. But it really does show that governments matter. Governments do matter. And we need to see a cleanup of the corruption in those three countries. And I do not mean to bigfoot them, but we really need to see where that $750 million is going and whether it is really being effective or, or not, because it doesn't seem to have had an effect of the outward flow of people from both of those countries. They don't all come to the United States of America, but the situation in life is so untenable that they leave. That, it's a sad, sad, tragic tale. We have a few minutes left for time for questions from the uh, participants. So if you would just raise your hand and identify yourself and direct your question to Senator McCain. Well, thank you very much. Right, right here. Yep. Well, thank you, Juan Carlos Zapata from Guatemala. I'm from the Foundation for the Development of Guatemala, actually. Um, thank you, Senator McCain. Um, very important remarks uh, about the fight against corruption in Central America. Thank you for what the, the U.S. government is doing in the region, and specifically in Guatemala, with CICIC and the support um, to the region. Um, before, I would like to before understand. Before you continue, I did leave one part out. Secretary Kelly said U.S. US drug consumption was to blame for 80 percent of the violence and instability in Central America. There's a lot of responsibility rests on the United States of America. Please go ahead. No, thank you. Um, and and the question would be, in terms of how much of that funding that most of the time goes to USAID could actually go to projects and programs that can actually increase productivity in terms of infrastructure, uh, connecting cities, um, generating more um, know-how that could actually um, generate more jobs in the country. Thank you. Well, USAID, I think, does a, an excellent job, and I strongly support it, and I'm worried about what we're hearing in the rumor that maybe they're going to fold USAID back in, which I would not like to see that happen. But you know, if you really want to make it effective, you've got to have the active cooperation of the government. You can't just parachute in and start building bridges or roads or do so much of the things that USAID can do. There have been numerous meetings with the three Central American presidents. There have been numerous studies and reports, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have been a lot of improvement. In fact, as you know, one of the major factors in our prison to, prisons today is members of those, of those gangs, uh, which is, uh, is really an unhealthy uh, situation. So, uh, I don't blame USAID, but I do think that, and I'm, I, I love America, I'm proud of our country, but when there is a demand for a product, there's going to be a supply. That's why this Mexican heroin is, is, is doing uh, so well. You know, one time we had a first lady that used to say, just say no to drugs. Her name was Nancy Reagan. So maybe we ought to start putting some emphasis on the demand side of this equation. 
and that's education. If you, I, don't, I wonder how many kids that have taken fentanyl realize how, how dangerous it is. I wonder how many kids realize that the what best way to end up on the street is to become a drug addict. Uh, and so I think that we are not doing enough here to try to stem the demand because economics 101 is obviously when there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. I'm not letting Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador off the hook, but I am saying that I'm not sure we're doing our side of the mission as well besides pouring money into it. Yes. Uh, Senator McCain, um, my name is Carmen Gonzalez. I run Latin America for Intelsat. I want to thank you for having taken the time and met with Liliana, the wife of Leopoldo, who is a dissident and in jail. You mentioned, and I agree with you, that to have uh, tariffs and, and other types of natures and boycotts actually hurt the country's people. Uh, given that that was not be a realistic option. What is realistic on behalf of the United States of America in helping this crisis in Venezuela and on the border of, as we all well know, becoming a communist country because at the end of the day, um, Maduro is and was raised in that type of uh, regime and education. And our concern is that we may have a country that's very rich in petroleum um, actually going away and causing another domino effect in the United States. So my, cons my specific question is, what can the United States versus the OAS or other institutions can help in this area? And again, thank you so much for having taken the time to have met with these people. Well, I thank you. You know, my favorite president uh, and the one that Margaret Thatcher said won the Cold War without firing a shot was Ronald Reagan. And I wrote a piece that was in the New York Times yesterday, as you may know. And I recalled when Ronald Reagan mentioned Nathan Transky's name, who was then a resident of the Gulag. And after the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall came down, Nathan Transky and his friends who were in the Gulag said, when Ronald Reagan mentioned my name, it was ricocheted all throughout the Gulag. Gulag, they knew it, they raised our spirits, we were able to resist. You know, why don't we speak up for these people? Why don't we speak up for those people that are in the streets right now, literally taking their lives and their welfare uh, at, at risk? Why don't we say that the guy that's in prison right now, the leader uh, of the opposition, why don't we, why don't, why doesn't President Trump, President Trump mention his name? It, it reverberates around the world. Why don't we speak up for human rights? The only reason why America is, was the, the last century was the American century, it was not because we were the richest or the most powerful, it was because we were a bastion of, of freedom and hope and liberty. And we weren't perfect, we made lots and lots of mistakes. But it seems to me the best way that the people who are being oppressed in Venezuela to start with was do as the OAS has done, speak up. Speak up and tell them we're with them. And that isn't the only answer, but it sure matters to them I've met with several of the people who are in the Venezuelan opposition, and one of their frustrations is that we don't have it high enough on our uh, agenda. Now, we've done some stuff in the Senate, and I'm pleased about that, but frankly, there's only one voice that really, really, really matters in the world, and that's the President of the United States. So I'd like to start that, and I'd also think we, we should make some promises and commitments to the people of Venezuela to help them in the event that they are able to return to democracy with a government that they can trust in. Look, their, their economy, as you know, is in shambles. We ought to commit now that we will help them rebuild the institutions, help them with their economy, help small businesses, that, the, that once they regain their freedom, that we will be there to help them with what is gonna be a gigantic task to recover what was once the wealthiest economy, one of the wealthiest economies in all of our of our hemisphere. So we have time for one last, last question. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time, sir. Um, do you think that... Uh, you want to tell the, us your name? Oh, yeah, my name is Alejandro. I'm from Mexico and uh, very proud Mexican. 
um, through generations in Mexico we, and all over South and Latin America, we were trained that, uh, and taught that we had to work a lot, transform our economies in order to be able to sell to the United States. Uh, actually, it was a big challenge. Um, we were told, and we know it's the most powerful economy in the world. Well, now apparently, we have them in, on your knees, you know, economies like Mexico. Um, my question to you is, uh, well, somebody did a takeover on your party, apparently in 80, 1980 something, he even said it, no? And if I ever want to be president or something, uh, I will use the Republican Party to do so. Uh, what would be the lessons for your party uh, um, with what happened in order to be able to play the responsible role you guys have in the world economy since you really are the most powerful nation in the world? Well, first of all, could I say that it's none of my business and I do not pretend or in any way intimate that I want to be involved in the upcoming elections. But I have told many of my American friends, fellow members of Congress, that if you elect a president of Mexico that is anti-American or really far left in many respects, that it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good for a whole lot of reasons, including cooperation against drugs, a whole lot of reasons. And when we say that we want to do away with the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's not helpful to a more pro-American candidate. So I'm, I'm very worried about the upcoming elections in Mexico. There's another aspect that I, we haven't talked about that I know that you know about and have discussed in our hemisphere, and that's the involvement of Russia, China, uh, in Latin American economies. They are, especially the Chinese, are playing a bigger and bigger role, offering infrastructure and all kinds of of, of things like that. And there's always the threat of jihadists coming out of Raqqa, which they are coming out now in a stream that they get to your country or they get across the border to our country. That is a real threat because they're coming out in large numbers as they see Raqqa is probably going to fall sometime in the coming uh, months. So um, I think what's imp it's, it's very important for us to understand, too, as politicians, that the Hispanic community will and does now, but will in the future, play a very major role in many states. Sixty percent of the kids in school in my state are Hispanic, okay? Someday, in the not too distant future, they will be voters. And that is the reality of the process. And unless we Republicans do a better job of outreach and making our Hispanic community in Arizona particularly aware that we are mainly with them, whether it be small business, whether it be taxes, whether it be pro-life, whether it be pro-military, there's a whole lot of areas, then we are gonna lose in, in our state. So that's, a, that's just a harsh reality. Um, I'll tell you a small item of interest. In the last election, I received 47% of the Hispanic vote, okay? But the interesting thing is, well over 50% older Hispanics who knew me. Younger Hispanics voted the other way, because they didn't know me, because for, for obvious reasons. Very interesting. So, um, all I can say is that I believe that we are facing challenges in this world that we have not faced uh, since the end of the world of World War II in 70 years, and that new world order is being upset in Europe, but it's also being upset in Paraguay, in uh, in, Gua uh, in Guatemala, in Honduras, in El Salvador. Uh, and there we're seeing a kind of a Argentina, Ecuador demonstrations, demonstrations that 10 years ago you and I would think it never happened. And people are taken to the streets and it's a commentary on social networking. Do not underestimate the influence of young people 
of social networking. Do not ever underestimate that. That is what gets them in the streets. That's what gets them to vote. And that's what gets them involved in the political process. You know, most of the young people on my staff don't own a television set. They don't need one. They get everything off the internet, obviously. So all of us who are in positions of responsibility had better understand that this new populism, uh, which is healthy in some respects, but also in dangerous in other respects. We just dodged a bullet in the French election, okay? But does that mean that that issue is now put to bed in Europe? I don't think so. And so I think we have to do a better job in both the United States of America and in Mexico of understanding and communicating with the younger generation, which is now becoming of age, and they're not satisfied with the status quo, whether it be in Mexico or whether it be in New York City. Could I just say I thank all of you for all you do Sometimes when we get fixated on Iraq and Syria and refugees and all that, we may not pay as much attention to our own backyard. I believe that my state is enriched, enriched by our heritage. I believe that my state it makes me a source of great pride because of our culture and our food and our celebrations and our achievements. And so what you're doing, I believe, is of the utmost importance. I'm glad you are here, and I commit to you that I will pay as much attention as I possibly can to my own backyard and my own neighbors who have made my life and that of my children and everybody else's children a much better one. And I urge you, not real soon, but maybe in the month of October, Please come out to Arizona. We take all plastic. <laughs> we take all plastic, and we'd love to have you come and visit us. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>